Welcome everybody. Good afternoon or good morning to you, depending on where you're located. Uh, I want to say thanks for uh, 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 tuning in to another one of the Micromatic uh, Dispense Institute webinars. Uh, I hope everybody is safe and well. All the uh, craziness that's going on. Uh, we, we really appreciate your time uh, for tuning into this and uh, we'll try to keep this to around 30 minutes or so to you can get around with your day. Um, hopefully we'll have time, including uh, questions. If anybody has any uh, at the end, we'll take care of questions at the end uh, to do that. So today we we're, we're want to talk about system maintenance, uh, long draw draft systems. These are uh, alive uh, uh, moving parts here that, that things need to be done with them. A lot of times people just out of sight, out of mind, uh, um, don't want to uh, take care of these and they uh, end up uh, biting us. So, when we don't want it to as well too. So we're gonna just go over some stuff that uh, to, to keep these systems operating successfully. Uh, my name is David Green. I've been with Micromatic since 2001. Uh, in 2006, I joined the uh, training team as a course instructor. We do all kinds of training draft related as well too, uh, as well. So I appreciate you uh, uh, tuning in again and uh, uh, hopefully we can uh, get through this. Uh, today, um, again, as I said, we want to talk about what what some guidelines, what needs to be doing, ongoing uh, maintenance, uh, things that we can do to, to keep these systems up and, and humming along a, a, as they would uh, to do that. Again, these are, are moving parts. They're alive. They never stop. They're, they run 24 seven. So when something happens and it's going to happen, uh, we want to be able to minimize any any lost revenue or, or downtime you know, due to uh, uh, system maintenance or, or, you know, some of these things when they go down, they can cause a lot of uh, beer to foam and, and uh, waste uh, down the drain. So, you know, what 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 could we do that, that you know, things that might prevent this stuff, right? Uh, we'll talk about some wear and tear items. Uh, what, you know, what what can we do here? So we're, we'll talk about, uh, you know, daily. What, what can we do daily uh, just to help? This really helps out in the long term. If you mitigate some of these things uh, uh, before they get to be bigger problems, it really, really can help out too. So we'll talk about daily uh, uh, every two weeks or so. Line cleaning is the biggest thing we can do here. Uh, and when we do that, it, it opens our eyes to a lot of other things that are going on with the system. And again, we can do that. So uh, we can head off other issues as well to do that. So and then we want to talk about, you know, what needs to be done uh, on a quarterly, four times a year, uh, semi-annual, twice a year, right? What, what do we need to do? And then there's items possibly uh, an annual yearly uh, maintenance as, as well too. So uh, to do that. Uh, towards the end then, we'll try to talk about some of the benefits uh, of doing uh, this maintenance to keep your system up and running at uh, a high volume. And then, uh, you know, some of the even losses that can happen because of uh, uh, to do this. So hopefully, you know, we don't want downtime on these draft systems as well too. Uh, again, depending on the time, we'll, we'll try to have time for questions and answers uh, towards the end. Uh, if you have any questions, go ahead and, and type them into the chat feature at the top part of your screen. I believe it's the top right of your screen. So daily, just things that we can do every day. Uh, uh, some minor stuff. It doesn't going to take all your whole day to do this stuff, but uh, uh, you know where, where the uh, kegs are in the walk-in cooler, uh, in the keg box. Uh, uh, what's going on there? Are, are they empty? Are they uh, uh, you know ready to go uh, as well? Um, you know, we can uh, uh, check out our pressure supplies, our gas, whether we're using CO2 or a blend or something else here. Uh, one of my uh, famous, maybe not so famous sayings is, is no gas means no beer, right? If, if we're out of gas, if it's turned off or something, that's going to be an issue as well uh, to also like to know for the gas as well. This is not a, a very sexy thing to be looking at or whatever, but you know, who's responsible for the gas in, in your bar, restaurant, tavern, whatever the case may be. So somebody should be familiar with this uh, at, at best as possible. OK, uh, uh, gas leaks are, are a, a for sure thing that goes on in, in lots of draft systems out there. Um, uh, they, they do happen as well, too. Um, you know, refrigeration temperatures. It's all about temperature with draft beer, you guys. Temperature, temperature, temperature. So, uh, you know, meaning what is the temperature of the walk-in? What is the temperature of the keg box? Uh, um, you know, I, I think you should know what these 
uh, uh, should be uh, to be able to do that. I'm a big fan and I'll probably mention a few times, uh, maybe even a cheat sheet we could put on the inside the cooler door or wherever somehow that, hey, this should be at this temperature, this should be here, stuff like that, just so we know or anybody else in the establishment can can possibly look at that and say, hey, if we're out of uh, uh, the, the range on that, maybe that's uh, what's going on as well too. So uh, the keg storage, the walk-in cooler, if we have that, uh, I can't tell you how many times I've literally walked into someone's walk-in cooler and I know I don't even have to take a temperature that the temperature is not right right uh, to be able to do that so if I can head something off first thing in the morning possibly we could be pouring beer by lunch uh, uh, to do that or, or dinner uh, if you do have a long draw glycol chiller uh, we want to make sure that that's up and running obviously if it is a glycol system this is really the heart and soul of your, your, your draft beer system, right? It keeps the beer cold from the cooler to the uh, taps uh, as well. So if that's not working, uh, we want to do that to make sure that it is. Uh, I always kind of feel funny talking about this, but I, I do think it makes sense that, uh, you know, a lot of times people will walk by these units constantly and they don't give them any thought, second thought or anything uh, to do that. But uh, it, 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 listen to what the, the noise that these things make sometimes as well, right? They hum along depending on the unit some of the smaller ones are pretty quiet the bigger ones can make a little bit of noise but you know if you hear the same noise every day but then you hear something different well maybe that's something that it's telling you something right uh to be able to do that so um you know and and you know daily we can just wipe things down uh, a lot of times we get a lot of growth and things with beer that can can make things funky and, and make them uh, not work as well uh, as as these things go on and on so just just some wipe downs can really go far the uh, uh, another daily issues is the point of dispense, meaning the beer tower, right? I, I always call the beer tower the money machine. Uh, that's the only thing really your customers are going to see is that, right? They don't see what's going on in the basement or in the back of the house or whatever to do that. But uh, I, I think that the, the beer tower, uh, you know, if we can clean those external surfaces, uh, a lot of them are stainless steel or some other uh, metal surface that you don't need to do a lot, but they just need to be, you know, wiped down uh, uh, with a, a soft cloth and, and whatever Windex or whatever you have, depending on, <clears throat> excuse me, the material your tower is made out of. But uh, and that can be done the night before on shutdown as well, too, that, that, that to be able to do that or when we open up as well, too. Uh, daily, ideally, if we could give the, the faucets a little love, the faucets give us a lot of trouble as well. So. Um, depending if it's a regular style faucet or a flow control or a, a, a nitro style faucet as well they do get gunked up and if we can give them a little love uh, to do that there's all kinds of ways to, to clean those on a, a daily basis without breaking them down uh, to do that i've seen little turkey basters or a condiment bottle that we give them a rinse uh, again could be at close last night or whatever the case may be but that really goes a long way to uh, uh, helping us have some a smooth operation as well the drip trays or the, the 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 grates down below uh always good to uh make sure that those are clean and uh, uh with with that keep the critters out of there uh good good to pour some hot water down there again it could be done the night before or in the morning before we open uh get a coffee pot full of hot water and pour it down there keeps everything clean and your drains flowing as well too uh, as well and glassware we've talked about that in the past but we want to make sure you know daily that that we do clean the glassware it is clean it's sanitized it's dry it's it's ready to to go when the customers are ready uh skipping now to you know on a daily to let's go to what we should do two weeks so the most important thing you can do is just clean your beer lines you guys that that is the most important and two weeks is the, re the recommended uh uh cleaning time for that as well too so when we are cleaning we want to make sure safety first right we have to use chemicals we use uh, uh, different things that some people aren't used to doing uh, so glasses and gloves for sure uh, chemicals to add it to water we don't want that splashing up uh, on us as well too very important that we rinse with water 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 never beer i have seen cleaning techs out there in the uh, rinsing with with customers beer uh, they don't seem to, to rinse long enough as well too. Uh, the chemicals, again, these are chemicals are hot, but they need to be. So you want to make sure we know what's going on. We don't want to spill them on the counter on any staff or on ourselves uh, to do that. Oh, it's good, a good idea when you're done with your chemical to put it on the floor, put the cap on it uh, to be able to do that. I like actually put it in, into a, uh, a bucket, uh, Home Depot bucket or whatever you got that, to make sure we don't spill it. 
uh, to be able to do that. When we do clean, we, we generally use warmer water and we could be using higher pressure because of uh, 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 recirculating cleaning pumps. So that can put some stress and strain on, on parts and pieces, hoses and that. So we wanna make sure that, you know, we're inspecting uh, for worn fittings, any defective connection as well too. Could be a minor thing, but it could be a, a bigger issue as well when we're cleaning. And then know what chemicals we're using as well. So safety data sheets are, are always a good thing to have uh, posted or have it somewhere in, in the facility. Standards, uh, the line cleaning standards, again, 14 days every two weeks, you guys. Cleaning, again, it is the most important thing uh, to be able to do that. So we wanna make sure we're, we're purging all that beer out of the system with water. Uh, we wanna make sure we have enough chemical uh, Direction say between two and three percent caustic solution. So what that means for every gallon of water that we're using, two to three percent of that uh, uh, will be of a caustic nature as well too. So and then hopefully t the right temperature. The warmer the water, the better the clean. But we have to be careful uh, with our temps. So somewhere around 80 to 110 degrees Fahrenheit is is the water temperature we're looking for. Just a really good rule of thumb on that is if it generally if it's too hot to stick your hand in the water, it's too hot as, as well. So. Uh, next thing, it's time. The chemical has to have time to do what it's supposed to do. So uh, at a minimum, we want to have the chemical circulating in the draft system for 15 minutes. And that's if we're using what's called a recirculating cleaning pump as well too. Uh, 20 minutes if we're using what's called a, a static or, or a, a, a pot cleaning as well too. Uh, so the chemical needs longer to do what it's supposed to do. Uh, uh, all the faucets need to be removed. Very, very important. The faucets, you guys, they're the dirtiest part of every draft system. So uh, if we do give them a little love on a daily basis, that goes a long way as well too. But uh, they need to be taken apart, uh, completely taken apart, brushed clean uh, as well. Uh, great time to uh, uh, replace any O-rings or washers. They, a lot of wear and tear items that win these O-rings, if they go on a Friday night, it's really a pain in the butt. But uh, 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 this would be a great time on a Tuesday morning or whatever to, to, to pay, make sure we get those cleaned up as well. Uh, then we're gonna make sure we get all that chemical out of there with cold water uh, as, as quick as soon as we can or, or after it's needed. Uh, as well. Quarterly, we're going to clean with an acid cleaning solution. That's for what's thing called beer stone. We'll talk about that a little bit more, um, but for sure, keep records of this. We want to document when it was. Was it this week? Was it last week? Things do get lost in the in the ether there, and we want to make sure that it's done when it is supposed to as well, too. So just a quick wrap up there. Uh, it, the, the proper uh, uh, line cleaning the principles. We must have enough time for the chemical to do what it needs. Hopefully it's in the temperature that we're looking for. The chemical needs to be right solution. Too little, we're really not doing anything too much. There's really no extra benefit for that as well too as well. And then agitation, if we're scrubbing that chemical through there, really, really is going to be a big difference in our, our uh, cleaning abilities. So what are we cleaning for? I know we've talked about this before in the past. If you're new to us, welcome. But uh, uh, what we need is uh, bacteria. Uh, you know, these bacteria, they're, they're not harmful to us, uh, to, to, to our health here, but they certainly can impact the taste, the smell, uh, odors, uh, even the appearance sometimes. So we wanna make sure that um, we're getting in there, sweeping that stuff out, dissolving it, removing it as well too. So the four main bacteria is Lactobacillus, Pectinatus, Pediococcus, Acetobacter. These are all things that are again, not harmful to us per se, but they can definitely make the beer uh, taste uh, sour, it could uh, smell rotten, uh, popcorn, buttery, butterscotch as, as well too. These are all uh, uh, bacteria that, that they are alive. So when they eat and they give off their waste product, it's in these forms as well too. So the idea is that we get in and get out, get it out of there before it sets up shop. Um, yeast, we have to, uh, uh, obviously no yeast means no beer, but yeast does fall out of solution and tends to lay down on the draft beer lines and then everything else can stick to it as well too. So we wanna make sure we get in there and get that yeast out of there before it can be a problem. Uh, mold is, is a, a generally an external uh, thing here. Mold has to have air to grow. So that generally meaning at the faucets or in the cooler at the coupler end of it as well too. You'll see a lot of mold in beer uh, coolers and stuff. And we wanna keep after that uh, as well too. Then the last thing is what we're really getting at is what's called beer stone. And this is a, a calcium deposit that it's completely natural to, to the beer uh, from different things, sources, but we need to get after that and remove that. Again, if it's on there, 
it's a place where these other uh, uh, beer spoilers can stick to it. Most common chemicals that we do use, um, sodium hydroxide is pretty much the most common thing. You may re hear it referred to as a caustic or an alkaline cleaner as well too. They're all pretty, they're the same thing as well. So again, we wanna make sure that we're using the right amount of chemical uh, to do that. Two to 3% uh, are, is what we're shooting for. There are other chemicals out there. Some of them are less effective as well. Uh, and then uh, a phosphoric acid it is for that beer stone we just talked about uh, that removes, uh, dissolves and removes that. So we wanna make sure that we're using the right stuff at the right time. Basically, there's really only two cleaning methods, either a pressurized a static soak, uh, which is acceptable for direct draw, kegerator type uh, uh, systems as well too. And usually it's some sort of a stainless steel can, one, two, three, four head can that very, very common out in the market. Um, there could be a plastic uh, pressurized jug that's used as well too. Uh, I do see it a lot of breweries and brew pubs that they uh, actually use a keg, an empty keg, and they're able to put chemical in that and use that to do that. That scares me because I'm always wondering if where that keg is going to end up and is it clean? Is that chemical out of there or whatever the case may be? But uh, uh, to do that, the second method would be what we refer to as recirculation with the cleaning pump. It, it is by far, by far the best practice for all systems out here. Many studies have been done 80 times more effective when we clean with the pump than, than static or just soaking line cleaning. Um, how that how we're going to do that uh, is is uh, uh, we need to have some equipment, have the proper stuff. So if you're not capable, or excuse me, if you're not willing to do this, there are uh, line cleaning techs, could be beer distributors as well too. But we want to make sure this will just give you a rough uh, outline how we did this. We have done a webinar in the past, of more in depth on the cleaning. And if you're interested in that, we can certainly send you the link uh, to figure that out as well too. But we want to make sure that we're cleaning. Just this picture gives you an idea how we're going to do that. Uh, uh, so we want to establish a sequence, right? We're going to push this chemical back and forth, back and forth through the system as well. So we do need some equipment to be able to do that. We're going to link the couplers together. Uh, the faucets do come off, again, being the dirtiest part of the draft system. My favorite thing about cleaning with the pump is the faucets must come off. So if they come off, hopefully, hopefully we will clean those uh, to be able to do that. So we're going to uh, connect all this stuff up together. Uh, as well, mix up our chemicals uh, and, and push water through the system to, to get all of the beer, current beer out of there, right? So uh, uh, we wanna make sure that we get that water, uh, that gets the, the beer out of there before we get the chemical in there. And then we're looking for a flow rate of at least one gallon per minute. We wanna hopefully go faster than the beer was going so we get a good scrub uh, uh, as well. Next thing, we're going to keep everything hooked up and we're going to introduce the chemical into the system, right? So we're going to mix the chemical in, in a bar sink. Be careful about a bar sink. They can be dirty as well, too. So I want to make sure that that's clean. If I do use such a thing, uh, mostly a lot of times people will use buckets or whatever. And even then, make sure the buckets are clean uh, uh, as well, too. So you could certainly add your faucets in, into the sink or into the bucket, and then they could be soaking while you're doing this research. Uh, to do that, a great way to do that uh, as well. So we're going to get the chemical all the way through the system. Now we talked about time, 15 minutes for this research, 20 minutes for the circulation. That 15 or 20 minutes does not start when I walk in or when the tech walks in the door, right? The chemical has to be in the system for that time to, to be able to do what it needs to be able to do. So once my time is up, uh, 15 minutes, again, recommended. You can go longer if you're doing something else. Uh, to do that. But now I'm going to make sure that I rinse. We need must rinse this chemical out of there. This is very uh, dangerous hot stuff. So we want to make sure that no chance of any being left in there uh, as well. So we're going to get that in. We're going to rinse and uh, rinse until we think it's all out of there. A lot of the chemicals are have a color uh, a dye to them for a, a safety issue, but just because the color or the dye, the blue or whatever color it might be is out of there doesn't mean that the chemical's out of there. So generally a pH paper, very, very good way, a pH meter, uh, whatever you have, just to verify that all that chemical is out of the system. Once we get done, we're gonna remove all of our connectors that we did to, to uh, uh, gang everything up here as well and then now the system is full of water we're going to retap the kegs and we're going to now the beer is simply going to push all the water out to the faucet as well too so that's how we'll do that and get ready to go 
Um, so again, every two weeks on that. Uh, quarterly though, keeping with the cleaning theme here, we need to use a phosphoric acid that we talked about before, and that's what's going to eat and dissolve and remove that beer stone that we talked uh, about as well too. So that that uh, beer stone, uh, it's it's a, a, a mineral. It lays down on the lines. It's a lot heavier than some of the other stuff, so it goes to the bottom, and then it's it gives a place for all of the other beer uh, spoilers to to attack and 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 latch on, so they can keep and grow and grow and grow. So we want to be able to do that. So this is quarterly though, but one big thing I see out there, this is not in lieu of the normal every two weeks cleaning, right? We need to clean properly, uh, but on that quarterly basis, we're going to clean with our caustic or alkaline, make sure it's 100% rinsed, and then we have to clean the same thing with our acid, our phosphoric acid. We got to make sure it's phosphoric acid, right? A lot of different chemicals at breweries I see, uh, and some of them can damage uh, uh, tubing or stainless or something like that. So we want to make sure. So uh, again, we want to make sure that we have the right amount of chemical and the right amount of time. Once that's done, again, we're going to rinse until pH neutral and now introduce our beer back in there. So uh, the acid, sometimes people are scared of that, but uh, it's only quarterly, four times a year. But uh, uh, we have everything hooked up generally with this stuff. So uh, we need to make sure that we do that. Please do not mix the caustic and the acid chemicals, though. That's not a good idea. Uh, back to quarterly as well, too. We want to make sure uh, these are thing, again, things people that people walk by. They don't look at every day. I understand that. But uh, uh, the refrigeration, right? Again, we talked about this, the, the glycol unit, your, your walk-in beer cooler, your keg box. If they're not cold, they simply cannot work uh, to be able to do that. So most refrigeration is what's referred to as air cooled. Uh, uh, so these condensers need to be cleaned. You can see that picture there with uh, uh, some dust and, and debris on that uh, condenser there. <clears throat> very, very common out there uh, to do that, whether it's dust or, or, or grease. If it's, uh, you know, there's food in the place, these can get really bad. If these units can't breathe, they simply cannot work uh, to be able to do that. So ideally, we should clean these things off on a quarterly basis. Uh, more often, if you if you want to, great. Uh, but uh, like changing the filters in your furnace or your AC uh, at home, if these things can breathe, they're going to work better uh, to do that. There are some what are referred to as water cooled units out there. Um, they use water instead of the air to cool themselves down, but we, we can uh, uh, talk about that uh, as well. So, uh, you know, the, the keg storage area, uh, the, the temperature controllers, right? The thermostat, the, whether it could be digital, it could be analog, whatever the case may be. Uh, I, I do like to verify that just because it says 29 degrees. Is it truly 29 degrees? So I can get a thermometer and actually kind of cross check that and make sure we're doing that uh, to do that. So um, the uh, again, that your beer cooler, your glycol chiller, that, that's the, the heart and soul of your draft system as well. If you're not comfortable doing this, uh, if you don't know what it should be, uh, just check with the manufacturer. You can check with Micromatic uh, to do that, uh, but for sure, let's get a, a, someone who's qualified, either a, a draft tech or a refrigeration tech, depending on what we're talking about, to be able to do that. Uh, I mentioned a cheat sheet earlier. I'm a big fan of that. Wouldn't be the worst idea to have, hey, what, what should these settings be at uh, uh, to do that, just so we know where they should be, and then when they get out of that range, we can uh, see if we're getting starting to have a problem. Uh, uh, sticking with the uh, the glycol on a quarterly basis, we want to make sure that glycol, it's an, a liquid antifreeze mixed with water in certain ratios, so I want to make sure I have enough of it uh, uh, so the, the bath is, is adequate. Sometimes this uh, things will get overflowed. Sometimes they'll, if we have a minor leak, they can get low and then not do what they're supposed to do. The antifreeze, uh, it does wear out. It needs to be refreshed from time to time uh, to do that. So uh, there is a tool that's referred to as a refractometer that will tell us the freeze point, uh, what temperature that glycol is going to fail to be able to do that. So we need to know that. Uh, basically somewhere around 18 months to two years is what recommended for a, a change on that antifreeze. Uh, remember, these things run 24 seven. They never stop until they stop. Uh, if that antifreeze does wear out, I've seen it a hundred times, the whole unit can actually freeze solid and your beer system is down for uh, uh, the count here. Okay, so that with that. Uh, circulation pumps, we have these pumps that physically move this liquid throughout the system as well. Uh, they run 24 seven again. So uh, are they running? They do fail. It's not if, but when these things are gonna go, right? Uh, to do that. So they do make some noise. It's, it's uh, 
you should be able to touch that. These things do run warm, but uh, uh, just listen to the noise they make. Put your hand on it. Possibly that's just what I do. Feel if it's uh, vibrate, if you can tell uh, uh, to be able to do that. Uh, and if we if that glycol is circulating 100% through the system back and forth as well. There are air cooled systems out there uh, as well, and uh, we want to make sure that they use a, a, a circulate blower uh, generally to push through. These are on shorter draw systems uh, uh, as well. Want to make sure that blower is running again that runs 24 seven. So if it dies, uh, your system is going to uh, not perform at all here. Uh, what can happen a lot of these things is the insulation falls apart on these older systems. So we do get air leaks. We need to make sure that system is airtight blowing through. So we want to make sure with that uh, to be able to do that. So and then uh, you know on a quarterly basis, not, it's a great time to possibly clean the walk in uh, to be able to do that. Um, you know any mold or mildew that to be able to do that. But you know if we're doing that on a regular basis anyways uh, on our two week cleaning, it, it shouldn't be that difficult. Uh, to do that shouldn't build up enough. Pressure system, the other part of the, the lifeblood of the system, right? We talked about temperature and the glycol. The other is your gas system uh, to do that. So depending on your system, if you have regulators, primaries, secondaries, are they adjusted correctly? OK, I, I always feel funny saying this, but if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But uh, you know, if it works yesterday, it'll work again. We don't want people changing these uh, people that shouldn't be changing these as well, too. So uh, depending if I'm using 100 percent CO2, a, a gas blender, uh, beer pumps, pneumatic beer pumps as well. These are all things that you know things happen to them. The gremlins get in and in, in these coolers from time to time. And so we want to take a look at that. Uh, to do that, so we can we can uh, conduct pressure leak tests as well uh, to be able to do that. Any damaged gauges or defective components, these regulators, boy, they just get beat to death out there. When people are changing tanks, they do get banked around and bumped. I see the gauges smashed and broken uh, uh, all the time. Very common. They they can be replaced. You can get a new gauge or you can get a whole new regulator. But again, if we have the no gas or the wrong gas, we can definitely affect the, the beer carbonation, the quality of it as well too. So uh, to do that, a lot of moving parts in there. People are changing kegs. They're in a hurry. They're doing things. So the tubes and the fittings, the connectors, they can become loose. They can get worn as well too. So great time uh, to go through the system if you can and snug everything up and make sure fix anything as needed uh, as well. Should we have any uh, uh, draft beer pumps? We, they, they do when they, they cycle, they exhaust, and if we're using gas to, to do that, we want to make sure that they are uh, that they are plumbed to a well ventilated area. And then again, any any loose connections or anything we need to repair uh, and keep after that stuff. Uh, twice a year, great. A couple of things to, to do here: couplers, right? Hopefully, we're we're cleaning these as we're we're doing our normal cleaning, but twice a year. Uh, they need to be 100% disassembled, uh, soaked to parts, uh, brush everything with the same cleaning solution. So again, be sure we have our, our proper PE, PPE, uh, glasses and gloves to be able to do that. That's another great time to evaluate, you know, any defective O-ring seals, uh, whatever. <clears throat> the more beer you sell, the more of these uh, uh, wear and tear items are going to take effect here. Uh, to do that. So if we can do that, uh, there's some O-rings that, that need to be lubricated that that uh, 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 control the, the ease of the coupler being tapping and untapping. So great idea to, to do that as well. If you do have fobs or profit maximizers, pro maxes, uh, they need to be cleaned, uh, taken apart as well too. Uh, uh, twice a year, highly, highly recommended. A lot of service calls on fobs because they're sticky and just full of uh, 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 beer stuff and, and they fail and that line can fail as well too. So uh, with these, we do want to take them apart and clean. I don't want these soaking in any solution. We're going to clean these uh, soft cloth uh, to be able to do that. There are again some O-rings, some seals that over time uh, uh, chemicals and things can affect these. So again, great time to replace those uh, as well. And then the drains on these can get uh, uh, kind of dirty and gunked up as well too. So we want to make sure that those are all cleaned as best uh, we can to be able to do that, put them back together, and we should be in business for another six months. Annually, uh, just some things here. Uh, uh, nitrogen generators are starting to be uh, a little bit more uh, prevalent out in the field. Uh, these need some love. They just simply go and then go and go in the back room or the basement, but uh, they do need uh, some annual maintenance uh, as well. There are some what are called pre-filters that, that do need to re be replaced, right? So. Uh, uh, Yearly is generally recommended. 
Uh, most of these have what's referred to as the hour meter on them as well. And so about a thousand hours is average depending on the, the type that you have. So either uh, a yearly or a thousand hours, these filters need to be replaced as well. So depending if you own the unit or if you're leasing the unit, if you own it, I would highly recommend that you do do these. But if you rent it, uh, I would uh, for sure get a hold of uh, your, whoever you're leasing it from and have them get in there and change these filters. Uh, if the filters aren't uh, uh, proper, <clears throat> we're not going to get good uh, clean nitrogen. <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, it can affect the, uh, the the quality of the product as well too. Okay, uh, as well. So uh, trunk line, it's a good time to evaluate that. Uh, we can't always see where this is, right? It's up in the ceiling, it's underneath the floor, uh, uh, sometimes that, but if you can see any, any parts of it or, or have access to that, it's good to see what's going on. Uh, sometimes over time, the weight of the beer, uh, things can, can crush some of this insulation. Um, we'll see sags, uh, uh, sagging parts as well uh, to be able to do that. So I wanna make sure that that's as straight and level as possible. Uh, to do that. Any kind of crush or sag or leak, we would want to get in there and uh, uh, fix that as well too. So uh, again, I know you can't always see this, but uh, uh, these, these are things that, that uh, certainly can cause trouble down the road. And again, if you're not comfortable doing any of this, uh, uh, you know, maintenance or whatever, just seek a qualified tech. Who put your system in? Who's uh, leasing you the gas equipment? Uh, who's your draft tech, uh, your refrigeration person, or your line cleaners as well too. These, these folks all have good information to share with you. Just real quick, we're running out of time here, but some of the, the, the benefits uh, uh, of that, um, you know, having clean beer lines, there's several case studies out there. Just one I'm going to refer to real quickly. It was a 10 line system, uh, ser uh, bar served 10 kegs a week. And, and by changing their cleaning from a, a four week uh, cycle to a two week, uh, they had showed an additional 4% uh, profit uh, uh, in, in draft beer sales, right? And that more than tripled the cost of, or, or paid for the cost of that cleaning, moving it from a monthly cycle to a two week cycle as well too. That's gonna ensure the integrity of the product as well, encouraging resale, right? Uh, you know, do not wanna have one and then not have another one because the, the beer is not right for whatever reason as well. And then that uh, uh, doing that maintenance, that's certainly going to minimize the downtime and uh, waste resulting in, in, in profit as well, too. Last thing real quick then, uh, same study. Uh, again, we kind of we're going backwards here, but uh, uh, by, by not having the proper line cleaning, the, the draft sales were down about 7% as well, too. So that's a pretty big uh, dollar amount there as well, too. But my other thing, though, is, is if that glycol unit, right, they never seem to want to break on a Tuesday. They're always going Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, or whatever the case may be. But, uh, you know, just, just lost revenue due to a failed glycol power pack. Uh, I just have some older numbers on there, but you know, five barrel system. Uh, if I was down for the weekend, I didn't get those five kegs. You know, that's almost three thousand uh, dollars of lost revenue as well, too. So sometimes this this maintenance can be uh, just again quick uh, to be able to do that. But boy, when it goes, it goes as well. So kind of all the time we have today. So do we have any questions uh, on any of that stuff? Be happy to help if I can. Okay, Dave, thanks for uh, all that great information. We do have a lot of questions here, so we'll uh, try to scoot through these as quick as we can. Um, great question. Um, should faucets be disassembled and cleaned every two weeks with the line cleaning, or is running cleaner through them as part of the line cleaning acceptable? So the faucets, again, are the dirtiest part of every draft beer system. They, they have to be taken apart. They could be taken apart. Again, they could, if we could give them a little love on a daily basis, that goes a long way. But for sure, uh, every two weeks, they need to be 100% disassembled, cleaned, uh, inspected, and put back together. Here's another one, which we get quite often, is two weeks is the time two weeks based on how much product is moved through the lines or just to a two week period recommended? 
So several studies have been done as well to uh, draft beer lines, pretty much everything. Some, somewhere between three and 10 days, everything gets dirty, okay? The more stuff that's in the beer, the more stuff that comes out of the beer. So you can sell one pint of beer uh, in two weeks, or you can sell 1,000 pints in, in two weeks. It really doesn't matter uh, to be able to do that. So it's not about volume, it's about the beer, what's in it, and, and uh, uh, falling out of solution uh, and, and sticking to thing. that That's how beer lines, that's how everything gets dirty is when stuff falls out of solution and can stick to it. So it's crucial that we keep that that two weeks. I do know many breweries that actually clean on a seven day basis as well too, so. Um, thanks Dave. We have several questions here asking about the cleaning process for coffee in uh, lines. Is it the same uh, process as beer lines as beer in the lines yeah so uh um you know we're recommending that that is uh, uh as, as well um to be able to do that we have to keep after that uh, i don't know enough about coffee so i don't want to say anything uh, that's wrong here but uh, uh basically whether it's coffee kombucha uh cocktails any of that stuff wine on tap um we're, we're, we're pretty much sticking to this more as needed. The more we learn about these other beverages, uh, uh, hopefully we can have some better information. Yeah, so so basically just to sum that up, we're, we're saying that it, it, yes, it basically should be cleaned the same way. Uh, if you're noticing a lot of buildup, then maybe increase the frequency. Uh, if you have, uh, we, we see a lot of issues with faucets also with, with coffee. So you definitely want to make sure you give the faucets some extra love with when using coffee. And then one more thing on the coffee. Uh, if you're making your own and you're using a beverage tank or a Cornelius type keg, that keg needs to be cleaned as well too. Boy, we've seen many, many uh, issues of things where the keg uh, has had a lot of residual re residue at the bottom of it and even enough to clog the pickup tubes and, and stuff like that. So that's one more thing on coffee again, or another cocktail or that if you're using a independent container, we need to make sure that's part of this cleaning process. Yeah, great point. Great point, Dave. Um, question from Matt. Should I turn off the glycol power pack during cleaning? That's a great question. <laughs> Matt, that's one of the questions that has been in my 20 years as well. Uh, personally, I always say no. If if I'm using a recirculating chemical, uh, uh, excuse me, cleaning method, as long as the water's moving, it will not freeze. A lot of techs are concerned about the water freezing in there and when we are using the static or soaking cleaning that is certainly a, something that can happen if we leave the water in for an extended period of time but uh, as long as that water and chemical are moving through the system uh, think about a river if you're in a, a cold area it, even though the, it's frozen on top or on the sides it's moving underneath right so so uh, personally uh, when I first started I turned a a, a power pack off and it didn't turn back on. So I just got kind of burned and, and it's just been my, pretty much my uh, rule of thumb is I leave them on. Okay, another one, this one obviously is coming from a brewer here, but uh, should we run sanitizer through the lines after cleaning? So I hear that from brewers all the time. You guys have lots of sanitizer. It, it we don't believe it. It, it as the, the cleaning beer line cleaning rule book has been written, sanitizer is not needed. Okay, after the fact, right? Uh, we're going to clean. We're going to remove all the uh, debris, everything that we're going to get on a two week basis, um, and then once we uh, uh, push the beer back in, the alcohol in the beer is a sanitizer in itself, right? So if you run sanitizer through there, again, I'm not saying you can't do this. But uh, I've talked to many brewers over the years and they, they are, uh, uh, firmly believe in this, that's fine, but how do you get the sanitizer out, right? Uh, do you use that do it with water and, 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 or beer? So uh, uh, the line cleaning, the beer line cleaning handbook does not uh, require it, but that's a personal uh, um, choice for you. Yeah, one of the things also we may just add to that, Dave, is that we, we have to be careful with sanitizers to make sure that they're not chlorine based. Ah, Obviously, you can yeah. have some 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 degradating effects of of the beer lines uh, using chlorinated products. So be careful with that. Yes, good catch. Um, lots of cleaning related questions. This is a, a great one from Mike. He asked, does CO2 degrade the cleaning process and does water quality matter? hard water versus soft water? So CO2, I, I do not know the 
degree on which it is, but but CO2 does degrade or, or, or makes caustic weaker. Let me put it that way. Okay. Is it enough to, to change it? I don't I don't know that that we know that, or at least I don't, but it does make it weaker. Uh, my chemical will never be stronger than the first pass through. So if I'm, uh, 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 you know, I'm pushing beer out with my caustic, then I, the beer has CO2 in it. It will make it weaker. I want that chemical to be as strong the first pass through as it possibly can uh, to be able to do that. Uh, I've read many studies in, in, on hard water and different things like that, uh, different chemicals. Uh, our chemical, uh, other chemicals I've seen out there are formed are, they're made to work in all water uh, types, hard water, soft water. We're in the Midwest. We have really, really hard water here uh, to be able to do that. You'll even see that when you wash your beer glasses or even your dishes, right? A lot of water spots uh, to do, be able to do that. But uh, um, you want to make sure that uh, uh, we can get your, your water tested or, or make sure that the chemical you're using is uh, a conducive to, to that as well. Again, our chemical has been designed to work in all water environments. Great stuff, great stuff. Here's a, one related to refrigeration that uh, is really important. It says, um, does high ambient air temperatures affect refrigeration? So as we talked about cleaning up the the, the, the condensers and the dust and the, the cobwebs and the things there, yes, uh, uh, all these units, uh, uh, most of these units, let me take that back, are, are referred to as air-cooled units, right? They use the surrounding ambient air to cool themselves, right? Think about uh, uh, standing out next to a, a window air conditioner or a central air conditioner, right? Hot air is just blowing off of that. That's removing the heat, right? So if these units are in heat, they have a difficult time removing heat. So we want to make sure the glycol, uh, again, uh, these power packs generally are made to be indoors. So I don't want them on top of a walk-in cooler, especially this time of year where it's 120 degrees up there. These, sim these units simply can't work, right? Uh, you have units for your walk-in cooler for the, your building. These are outside units that are made to be outside. Uh, uh, they've taken some of that into consideration, but uh, generally the glycol units are, uh, are not. So we, we get a lot of calls, you know, from uh, uh, Memorial Day to, or, you know, ha Halloween, and, and we have heat issues, but then they go away from Halloween to St. Patty's Day, right? Cools off in a lot of the parts of the country, so it's a cooler time for yes. So it definitely, long answer short, it definitely matters what temperature ambient that these units are sitting. Great stuff. Um, what are the contributing factors to foaming issues? <laughs> That's a pretty wide open question there, but yeah, you know, maybe touch on some of the uh, some of the high points there. Right, so it's all about temperature with draft beer, you guys, all about temperature, 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 temperature. And uh, so three temperatures to, that, that that can do this, right? Your walk-in cooler or your keg box, wherever the beer's at, right? If you do have a glycol unit, uh, uh, what is the temperature of that? And then is it, it, what's the temperature at the faucet? So those are our three suspect temperatures that we wanna take, right? So if the walk-in's working, but it's foaming at the bar, uh, the beer's hot at the, it, at, pouring in the glass, then we, we can kind of figure it out that it's a glycol issue, right? If, if, if it's the glycol is working, but the cooler's warm, we can kind of figure these things out. But it, it, there, there are a lot of issues. 90% of the foaming issues are temperature related, though. I will put it that way. There's lots of other things that can do that. Any irritant, any you know bad equipment, dirty equipment, these are all things certainly that can make beer foam as well too. Fobs we talked briefly about, but again, uh, I could talk for four days on, on, on this. So I apologize for cutting that short. Okay, last one. We'll let uh, everybody get back to work here. We're running a little long on this, but that's great. We got a lot of great questions here. Um, it says we have about um, 150 feet from the taps to the walk-in cooler where the kegs are. We do a 20-minute static clean with beer line cleaner. Should we be doing more? Well, so once the, the chemicals in the whole 150 feet, right? So however many faucets, we'll say you have six faucets. If you have enough chemical that, that can actually do that, then that is the right amount of time. You can certainly soak for longer uh, uh, 
and in fact, I would encourage it. But uh, you know, if the line is full, the line is full, and your chemical and your water ratio, right, two to three percent uh, uh, of caustic nature uh, to be able to do that, then then that is. Uh, I think we did. You might be referring to something that we we said on one of the slides there that might take longer, and I that's really more uh, with the mechanical uh, recirc cleaning pump, it may take longer because we're actually moving that chemical, you know, back and forth m multiple times through that 15 minute shift as well too. So I think that might be what you're considering. But, uh, you know, if you if you have the time to go a few minutes longer, I would highly encourage that. OK, great stuff. We have a, we have a ton of questions left over, but just for the sake of time, we'll we'll jump off here and uh, we will definitely if you guys just stay on, we'll, we'll definitely um, reply to all of your questions or answer all of your questions. Uh, Dave and I will both uh, jump on here and, and uh, respond to all of these questions. But again, I do want to thank you, Dave, for all the great information. Uh, for all the participants that were on today, thank you very much. We appreciate you. Uh, stay safe. Thank you. Thank you.